Okay, so supposedly we're on air. It says live. <laughs> we're live now. So, uh, uh, so here we are, the Lost Boys of JKD, uh, Ken O'Neill and myself, Christoph Glugson. We're here to give you the start of something monumental. Now, this is going to amaze you, engage you, and enrage you. To, to use my, <laughs> to use my uh, car salesman speech, and that's the rise and fall of JKD. Now, this is part one because we got a lot to cover. Tell your neighbors, tell your friends, get your parakeet and your dog to listen and play it back because we're going to cover a lot of things you probably didn't know about and talk about a lot of things that we're guaranteed the millennials don't know about because they're too young to have researched this. And I want to say that uh, we're not sponsored by anybody and we're welcoming anybody who wants to start sponsoring because, uh, you know, we need it and we'd like to compete with Joe Rogan <laughs> and <laughs> and the thing is uh, I will say I have a DVD that I'm gonna put about Mike Sandlin uh, the D, uh, it shows part of how Mike Sandlin would fight it's the deep JKD of Mike Sandlin I'll give a link below in the description to that DVD so if you don't have it get it and you can see about the man that we've been talking about of course it's not everything he did but it's it'll give you an indication and Ken has a unique, incredible offer for you. For those of you who are in the St. Louis area or in the neighboring uh, Cahokia Mounds or that side of Illinois, yeah. Granite City even, right? Whatever. That's not too far. And yeah, uh, 25, most people will travel that far. Yeah. So what is that? What is that? What is that? Uh, that offer that you give people? Uh, well, you know, this is funny how this comes up because this goes back to the California martial arts days in particular and other places I've taught. But there, because we had every bozo in town coming in the front door, you know, Joe Badass and all this kind of stuff, you know. And and the thing, the thing, you know, I, what, the thing I, I used to use is, is, is kind of a hook for people is because they've never taken kind of a scientific, uh, somewhat analytical approach to, to training like like really what, in in around in a sense, that's what JKD really really is. Uh, it's a philosophy. It's a, a way to analyze and approach and, and develop things. One of the things I, I figured out a long time ago that a lot of people didn't understand is is when you're in arms reach range, in particular, okay, and even a little further out for some of us that have trained a lot longer, it's pretty easy, pretty damn easy, and you know this too. To hit anybody, it will in the hit. And when you train the way we have for non telegraphic release, they can't stop it. They can't stop it even when they know you're getting ready to do it. I do this over and over again. I should do this to guys that would come in real cocky. I'd say, all right, I'll tell you what. First month back in the day, free classes. Now, I'm telling you what I'm going to do. I'm even telling you I'm going to do it with my right hand. Now, if you can stop me from popping you right above your eyeball, you get a free month of classes. And I even let them get ready. I'll say, okay, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Ha! Oh, sorry, no free classes, jackass. <laughs> now, I always treated guys like that who had the attitude, who came in with the attitude, yes, you know. I understand. And so, <laughs> yeah. So, just to recap for everybody that – if you can stop this, uh, Bruce Lee used to do that. If you can yeah. stop, if you can stop Ken's attack, which he's telling you what hand he's going to use, then you get free classes because he teaches more than just that attack. Well, but I'm old I'm, now. Well, only one free class if you stop it, because you might now, because I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think if you distract Ken, you know, if you bring in a really hot girl and put her to the side, that'd be the way to do it. But, oh, uh, man, you're giving them all a secret. So, or, hey, your fly's undone. You know, I'm old enough now. I might fall for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. <laughs> but uh, I think you brought up a good topic that leads to the very beginning of what JKD is. The, the rise of JKD started when Bruce started being analytical and started looking around what were the faults of what he was doing before, and that was Wing Chun. Now, I've taken heat for over 20 years internationally. I still take it for pointing out the faults of other people's martial arts. And that's why I say I'm a combat science, scientist, because 
uh, you don't get anywhere with medicine or, or aerodynamics or anything if you don't learn what is better than what you're using. And that's where Bruce, uh, now everyone's like, oh, it was so great. You know, it was so great. At the time, people didn't like Bruce. They didn't like Bruce. The Chinese community didn't like Bruce because he was he was uh, allowing in guilos, that's the Cantonese term for foreign devil, in, who are non-Chinese, into classes. And Bruce was taking other things than Wing Chun because Wing Chun was not working very well for him. And he and a fight lasted longer than he wanted it to. I've also experienced that too. I, I kind of have an ego about that too. With normal people, with a normal person, I don't think the fight should last that long, you know, unless I want it to. I've kind of got an ego problem there. But uh, I think that uh, something that a lot of people don't know about, especially now, is how hard that was. Uh, for Bruce to get new information back in the day, I guess we say. I mean, Ken, uh, go ahead and explain even for you and me, well, me too, how difficult it was just to get information back then. Yeah, it really yeah, was. It was. <laughs> we didn't have the internet. We didn't have the internet. Yeah. So to find, to find any, any information, I, we were just talking about this off air for a minute, you know. I was just trying to get a simple book on Aikido. Wait, it's called This is Aikido, Koichi Tohei, one of the original students of the founder of the, of the art, right? And I had to go through tons of phone calls to anybody that did any kind of oriental gift trading stuff. Finally, I found this little shop downtown St. Louis. Had to drive 23 miles just to buy a lousy book on one martial art. I mean, this used to be quite a process, you know, quite a difficult process to get anything. You know, and, and, and you, you couldn't just go online and Google people's names that you heard about and go find them because that didn't exist. So it was a, it was quite a quite a pilgrimage to, to even find people That's and totally find out who they were, let alone to physically find them. It was tough. A lot of work, a lot of time. Yeah. Commitment. The sources the sources were few and far between. And something that people don't understand now because they've had 20 years of MMA is that Combining things was very difficult because you would find people who didn't want to teach you if they found out you were going somewhere else. Oh, yeah. Uh, I know for a fact most karate places, uh, Taekwondo, Korean, Japanese, uh, there were more Korean places where I was at than anything else. But they didn't want anything to do with you if you were busy learning boxing. <laughs> I oh, mean, yeah. They, they would, literally wouldn't let you into class. <laughs> if you told them, you couldn't even get in. Yeah. And then when uh, I remember, because when I was, you know, we're talking about when I was young, I was taking fencing, the, which is kind of pointless, actually, to tell you the truth, as, as far as it applies to real fighting and real, and real duels or real blade work, kind of, kind of, kind of pointless. <laughs> but the, uh, I was taking judo and I was also doing, um, uh, that was I was doing a Korean art, and they were like, "Well, which one is it? Which one are you going to do?" I was like, well, "You know what I mean? Like, why can't I do? What, what's the problem here? Why can't I do both?" And that was at a university with two different teachers. I mean, one it wasn't at the same time period, and it, it wasn't the, wasn't the same days or anything. But they would say, "Oh, uh, how come you're doing judo in the?" in the Korean thing. And then in judo, they'd say, why are you doing uh, the, the karate stuff? And, you know, I mean, it was very difficult. The mindsets are what we're talking about here. The paradigm shifts are what are enormous. That is the biggest thing that JKT struggled with and on the way up, on the rise up. Bruce was fighting against huge paradigm shifts that had been around, for, uh, not shifts, but paradigms that had been around for a long time thousands a year maybe uh, I mean okay way back if we go way back to the Greeks and the Romans fighting in the in the Colosseum and, and that sort of thing then and of course Vikings and whatever uh, my my paradigms my frameworks those people were using whatever works they didn't care but later you got into very vested interest groups like you must use a kick <laughs> to solve the problem with Taekwondo or or, or Tang Soo Do and you must 
block. I can remember in Shotokan or whatever, you must block this way. Your block is no good if you don't block. It's like, hey, did you stop the damn punch? You know what, I, what I'm saying? And they would routinely say that boxers were wrong. How can you say a boxer is wrong when the boxer can come in and beat your head in? You know, these guys, <laughs> these guys had, you know, they didn't have mobility. They didn't have footwork. They weren't used to contact. They, their, their whole idea of what we're talking about, their, their perception, their depth perception and their reality of getting hit was off because all those people were stopping all the time, throwing punches and kicks, at least this far away from the person. They didn't have a sense of real distance. I mean, back in the day, can you can you remember that, uh, Ken? Like oh, when you oh, oh yeah, these guys would go ring fighting all the time, and then some of them would try to transition into our classes. And guess what? What you train is what you do. You know that as well as anybody, right? So if a guy practices just touching all the time, guy walks in and that's what he does, and it's like, well, I touched you back. The problem is my hand traveled about another eight inches through your body. <laughs> That's why you're on the ground. And you're right. The contact training was missing from a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff in those days. Yeah. And uh, uh, so one of, the, one of the aspects was that Bruce did was he, he was realizing that he didn't have certain components. He was missing a lot of components. And so he started mixing things. Yeah. Did, he, did he mix the best stuff? It's kind of – there's a lot of things that – there's a lot of things that Bruce missed. One of the reasons, because he didn't live long enough, number one. Right. That's the biggest, I'm convinced, yeah. 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 He didn't live long enough, and it was damn hard to find sources like we're talking about. He you was, you and, and he was unable He was unable to read several languages that you needed to be able to read because there were things. There was a complete French uh, street fighting system that had been around long before he started it had it had died out though. By the time Bruce was born, it did it didn't exist anymore. But it had existed, and it was never a sport. And it did everything that Bruce was trying to do. He later took things from it because it it it, it had components that became savant la boxe française, and he took things from that. But he never he never found the original street fighting system. He also didn't look at real dueling. He didn't. He looked at the sport version. If he had looked at the real dueling manuals, uh, he would have found a lot of things that would have been much better for him. You know what I'm saying? He would have. He wouldn't yeah. have wasted so much time because yeah, there's that, guys doing that now. Yeah, there's. I know guys. I know one in particular who's. That's yeah. what he does. Yeah, yeah. and it, and there, and there's a lot of things, and he didn't know about even the rough and tumble fighting from the frontier frontiersmen uh, in the United States. I mean, there's. This is all. I did research built off of his research. You know what I'm saying? So I know more than Bruce knew because I've lived longer than Bruce. And I also built off of Bruce's, um, off of his foundation. The, uh, but the, what my point is that Bruce couldn't get everything. You know what I'm saying? He could not sure. get everything. He didn't have access, yeah. He didn't have access. He didn't live long enough. Right. Uh, a lot of people who try to imitate that JKD that he was, doing when he started making that transition in the in the 60s the late 60s is a complete failing to the jkd methodology exactly uh, yeah and yeah. and and this is something i mean the reason why bruce started going into grappling was because gene labelle was a stuntman on the green hornet and this is during the period of time when Gene LaBelle was a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous man. He'd hurt a lot of people. He grew up in a boxing gym. His mother was a promoter. He uh, sparred. He actually sparred with Sugar Ray uh, Robinson, the first Sugar Ray. And uh -huh. uh, and he kn he knows. I mean, he knows all sorts of tricks. Uh, real dirty boxing, not that fake stuff people are trying to promote as the Filipino thing. He knew real dirty boxing, and he of course was a national judo competitor. And then he was a then he was a catch as catch can guy who can just rip you apart, limb from you know everything he grabs he can break. The point being, at that point in time, he told Bruce, "If I capture you, which I will do at some point, because you're not you don't have you don't have a place to run around here in the studio, you're done with." 
and Bruce didn't think so, <laughs> but he did capture Bruce, and so that's why that's why Bruce in his in Game of Death, uh, and then in uh, uh, Into the Dragon, he has grappling moves in it. Of course, some of them are fake holds, like the thing he's doing to uh, Sam Hung and Enter the Dragon is not a legitimate hold. It's you know what I'm you know what I mean. It's a it's a fake hold where the, he's selling it. You, you know what I'm you know what I mean. But yeah, and I took that as an ex just as a total tribute to Gene, though that he put that in the opening. Uh, it's like the opening scene or almost. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a total tribute to. <laughs> <laughs> I bought you your skill, sir. <laughs> well. It, it is, and also everything that's in that book, uh, in the Dow of JKD, which we were just talking about before yeah. we went on here, is uh, all the grappling stuff is directly from Jean LaBelle. And if you have Jean LaBelle's very first two books, you'll see all of those diagrams were in the first two books. But what, what we're trying to point out here is that JKD represents a, a methodology, a science, an analytical approach to fighting. and and Bruce, of course, was the progenitor of this, and we come from that. That's our background. That's our, that's our background. We've gone on to explore other things, and we did something the same as Bruce did. Bruce took uh, JKD, and it was an expression of Bruce. The way he, Bruce, I mean, of course, you're looking at the, t the movie fighting version, which was not his actual fighting version, but there are certain things that Bruce did because of his body type. He moved very quickly in and out. He's going to keep the distance because uh, he doesn't have, he can't, li literally, he cannot get in a phone booth with a 300 pound guy. He can't do it. You know, I mean, he's with, you know, he doesn't, can't do it. So he's going to move in and out and he's going to strike and he hit, he hits hard for his weight. Does he hit as hard as someone who's 220 pounds and a professional kickboxer? No, you know, but, but he hit hard for his weight. And uh, he was a lot faster than a 220-pound guy. That's what he, his speed and his movement were his skills. So everybody tries to imitate that, but that may not be your uh, that may not be your skill set, your attribute set, really. I should there say. There you go. There you go. See, it's mimicry rather than applying the process. Oh, the process. Yeah. Say that again, because that's that's uh, crucial. Yeah, those guys are mimicking what he did rather than applying what he taught you know they were mimicking his movement they weren't applying the process and jkd is a process very much so as we were talking about more i know we'll go into it more in a minute but you know that's that's what it's all about it, it was a methodology for how to analyze things and you know who doesn't remember the old phrase man you got to remember this this is the key component right you you look at an art you analyze that art you work with it, you practice with it, you use their training methodologies, you use various techniques, et cetera, from that art, you see what fits your body type, and you have to apply Bruce's methodology to, to, to do that, right? And then you take the stuff that you can use effectively, and you gotta really pressure test this on with a lot of people, combat conditions, right? If it doesn't work for you, you flush it down the damn toilet. You don't keep doing it just because so-and-so XYZ in 1922 living on Fifth Street created it you, you have to get over that mentality you know pay these guys their creds right have show respect for all these guys that came before you that did do things okay but if if something they created doesn't work for you don't keep doing it just because they did it that i see a lot of that and that wastes a lot of time and it creates a lot of dangerous situations for guys that have to really do this in real combat yeah that uh as i drink my soda water which i just want to tell <laughs> This stuff is weird. I just, I, I don't know. I just, I don't know. I don't know the attraction, but I'm drinking it. Anyway, uh, my point here is that that's very important to say there's a giant difference between the Oriental world, which is based off a of tradition, and the Occidental world, which is uh, built off of results or pragmatic uh, results. Uh, you can say it that way. And that is the big difference. And you have all these people do a fallacy, which is called not a true Scotsman fallacy is what it's known in logic circles. And that's where they say, well, that's not a real Wing Chun guy. A real Wing Chun guy could have won that fight. He just didn't practice it long enough and hard enough. Same thing with a Taekwondo guy. Well, he wasn't a real Taekwondo guy. A real Taekwondo guy uh, could have beaten him. He just has to practice more and longer. Well, then it must be the wrong answer. 
if it takes you five years to be able to do a skill that's perishable that you can't do like let's say, let's say high kicking for example if you doing high kicking you can't do high kicking when you're carrying weight you can't do high kicking on snow or mud or when you're in sand uh, at your knees you can't do it when the pants are too tight you, uh, you can't you, you can't you can't do it a lot of people can't do it unless they've warmed up which unless you're in a warm environment may not work for you either you're not going to pull it off in the Arctic it's not the answer so again you're using the wrong vehicle to get there like uh, you want to you want to say okay I'm gonna get to St. from St. Louis to to Los Angeles and I, I'm gonna take a horse you could eventually get there, but it's not the it's not a good time investment. And that's where you and I have what we've done. That's like we were talking about trapping. Because a lot of MMA guys, BJJ guys want to say Wing Chun guy. We're not Wing Chun guys. You and I are not Wing Chun guys. Can we trap? Yeah. Do we use it? Hell no. We don't use it because we do other things. I go accidentally to accidentally only. Accidentally only, it sort of happens, you know. Yeah. And I find when the trapping happens. Is usually somewhere in this transition from very close quarter, very uh, fast striking exchanges, and it's transitioning into grappling for yeah. one reason or another, right? And yeah. somewhere in there, it just happens. And a lot of times I notice, and this is where I give Sistema a lot of credit, because the way they work on so-called trapping, they just call it stickiness. But it's more like... Your, your full arm is trapping like another guy's arm or half of his arm as you're transitioning into, into a takedown. It's not this real crisp little clean like, I'm just going to trap you right about at your wrist and come over the top. And yeah. That stuff happens so rarely, it's ridiculous. you know. And here again, you're trying to force something that almost situations don't occur like that unless you're playing the game of standing in front of each other and you're doing that structure back and forth and you're feeding those nice linear shots all the time and that's it you know otherwise i poo pooed that a long time ago and i was ostracized from my own group for saying this shit's useless for me most of the time why i said it to dan and asano why what's the point he didn't have an answer at the time well he just kind of ignored me you know I guess I agree with you. I agree with you. And personally, what I, what I've transitioned to doing from that is uh, is well, if it's a kid, if it's a kid messing around with me, I will do trapping. I did it against some moron in a bar one time because he was doing a bunch of he was doing a bunch of Chinese moves and stuff. And I just went I went over to him. And I, I, I like triple and quadruple trapped him. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, it doesn't work, and it's not. It's not no, something. No, I mean, I, I just I, overemphasis. I, yeah, overemphasis. Yeah, I, I just did it to show him, like you know, here I can do this formalized stupidity uh, and shut you down. You know what I'm saying? And the guy was like amazed, and to me, it was. I mean, I would never do that if I was really trying to fight the guy. You know what I'm saying? I would have. I would have just headbutted. I would have headbutted him. You know what I'm. You know what I mean? That would have been it. <laughs> Up and just <laughs> yeah, I would just headbutted them. You know, I was I would just head. You know, and because only things are cultural. Now, people who live in the UK headbutt, but people in the United States don't headbutt. And many My other guys do. We like it too, man. It's a great. It's a great tool. Yeah, I use it. I use it exclusively for for like seven months of, out of my life at one point. But the uh, that's well, in your DNA, isn't it? <laughs> that's, that's, that's a Scottish DNA. <laughs> I think so. But, um, <laughs> but, but what I what I was going to say though, however, is that since we're we're pointing out the truth, and that's where we're controversial, but we don't really care. I mean, because we're more about giving people the honest truth than keeping the lies alive. Is that we can also say that about the FM, the Filipino martial arts guys and the select guys. They're also selling a bunch of Prearranged moves that just aren't going to happen, are they, Ken? I mean, you know. You know, it's you can't say they have no value at all. Of course, however, what I see more often than not, pressure testing these things is is, uh, and not just for me, but other guys that that I used to, I used to, I had a cool thing going for a few years. It was pretty neat. A group of us from different arts would get together on a Saturday afternoon, and this is the best, right? And everybody would take turns and say, okay, I want to kind of do this and that. Let's test this. Okay. He goes, because I want to see if my ability to enter, to get in for takedowns, will work against uh, uh, your hand speed, you know, because you're good with a knife. And another guy would say, well, I'm just going to work 
um, Muay Thai uh, entries into elbows uh, against your attempt to grapple. And that kind of testing, man, is where you really, really learn. And these are guys that, that, that know how to do what they're doing, too. And they're trying to test some of their best stuff against other guys' best stuff. And, man, you walk away from those classes with, with eye openers every single time. That was the true JKD class, right, where the whole idea, Bruce, Bruce showed this more in those little that show short segments. Remember the TV show Long Street where he was training yes. the blind guy? Yes. Oh, that shit was priceless, man. You guys got to go on YouTube and look at that stuff. That was how – that was Bruce's real teaching, man. Every class was a standalone lesson. Now, this is why Norm Travis – Gets a, gets a boner when we have classes because he says, you're doing that, man. Every time I walk out of here, that class was a standalone lesson. I can There's something I can take out on the street after every class. And that's something that stuck with me about that's JKD process work. You know, every class should be a lesson in itself. You know, it's not just part of the A through Z progression of techniques. Yeah. Oh, I no, I agree. I, I, I uh, Of course, you know, I agree with you. <laughs> you know, I, I know. I know um, you do. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. And, but the thing, what, what you're talking about is 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 cool and it's good, and I like it. We'd have body armor nowadays, so you can really go at it. You know what I mean? With body armor, you can really. And the thing is, like, the the problem is, uh, let's uh, man, we get so much to cover. But you know, when you'd have a grappler, I mean, a wrestler, you have a wrestler facing. Uh, Somebody like Muay Thai or even more strong, like uh, uh, Burmese boxing, which is even more brutal. Uh, and the grappler, though, could go 100%. And the problem is, is that if, if the Muay Thai Burmese boxing guy goes 100%, you may get someone really seriously injured. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's very dangerous. Very dangerous to do this. So, you better believe it. Yeah. Good point. So it the, is. the problem Ooh. was, it gives an artifact, it gives a skewing of results. And it, that's where you get people saying, well, you know, the the wrestler is always going to prevail. Yeah, they're going to prevail against a normal person who's – now, I'm not saying like a Muay Thai guy can stop a, a, a wrestler, but they can if they're training against a wrestler. Yeah, and that was the whole point of what we were developing, yeah. yeah. And, you know, to answer your thing, because this is a good point, <clears throat> the guy doing the Muay Thai was – if he wasn't the first, he had of almost been for sure probably the second guy trained in Muay Thai in the U.S., who actually then went to Thailand and fought pro, had a pro fight. This was way back in the 70s, okay? And this particular guy, Ron Smith, whose skills are phenomenal, I mean, he started in boxing gyms when he was six, and then he started, he was one of the very first guys here, trained by a Thai coach here, to actually even do Muay Thai in this whole area. So, so you know, Ron's skills were very high. But so, you know, we would even j just take like a simple forearm pad because that's all we had back in the days. But the guy had enough control to throw the, to, to throw the, uh, an overhand, overhead uh, elbow shot, right, at a grappler, do it for real, but still have some enough control to not kill the guy. Plus, like you said, uh, cheap armor. We didn't have great stuff back then. But, you know, those, those foam forearm, yeah. those pads, yeah, yeah, those old things. And that's how, yeah, the white ones that you could go buy at Walgreens drugstore, that crap, you know, they were made for protection against for a bruise, you know, oh, to get not get bruised. Yeah, that kind of stuff. But that's the kind of stuff you got to do, you know. And, yeah, more sophisticated armor now, which I have mixed feelings. And I, I'm sure you're this way too, but you don't want to do armor too much because that can skew things too, you know, because it does, as you just point out, it doesn't feel the same when you get hit wearing that stuff as it does when. You're not wearing it. I mean, we wear a really thick chest protector sometimes, the ones made for boxing coaches, ringside put out, really excellent stuff, just really to give guys confidence to see that they can punch right through that shit too and still oh, knock the wind out of a guy. You know, we use it a little differently, you know, because that same punch, man, you're caving in ribs, you know. So Yeah, yeah. That's the, that, that's actually the point with that. If you're, if you're moving the guy who's wearing armor, yeah, that you're doing damage, you know. It, yeah, so I mean that's one thing now. But what I wanted to get back to, uh, besides saying that, was something you talked about when you're saying people were trying this and that. Getting back to my other point about the Filipino martial arts and the Salat stuff, did you see anybody ever pull off any of that crap entry crap that they do? Especially, you know how they want to come in and Salat wants to come sideways, and you know what I'm saying? 
you know, and you know I'm going to pass over here. I'm gonna, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna yeah, pass yeah. over here, yeah. and then I'm going to turn sideways and knock you down this way and, and drag your foot out from underneath you. That shit is – I've never seen anybody do it in any fight. I've never seen any of those Salat guys ever show any footage of anybody pulling it off in a real fight. And if it's real, there's some place you're going to see it. You know, I've only seen it. See, this is the – okay, here. Okay, this is what Bruce found too. This all has to do with JKD. It's part of the methodology. You can – you have to be alive. Now you hear all those guys, especially especially Vunak was the one who started saying, it's got to be live. It's got to be alive. No, what he means, as opposed to two guys dead, like two guys dead aren't going to be doing anything. You know what I'm saying? But that what it means is dynamic because if you have static – partners who would just throw a punch and then they wait right that's what happens with the filipino stuff or the salat somebody throws something leaves it out hanging and then this guy does, this guy does seven or eight moves and the guys are like wow he's incredible the hell he is because that other guy is not going to do if you were fighting anybody like that you could do anything you wanted to i could do a capoeira i could do cartwheels there <laughs> Yeah. But the yeah, that's, that freeze frame is, training is dangerous to do too much of that because yeah, that becomes a habit too. Hang, leaving it dangling, you know. Then you can just like how about this one? Just like you're doing knife a knife exchange, right? And you yeah. you disarm a guy, and then you uh, immediately uh, get the knife right back to him to feed you again. Yeah, you know, if there's guys that have yeah. failed in oh, combat because they have the habit of handing the weapon back. I, I I saw a cop. I saw a cop talking in an interview, a jujitsu guy, and and he did that. Uh, he actually disarmed a guy on the street and handed him the knife right back because it's a training habit. How yeah. crazy is that? Well, the the point the point is uh, what I what I'm I want to harp on is that if you don't change your training, you're not going to change your results. And, and well, that's my point. That's what I'm trying to say too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and be and, careful and, how you train. <laughs> yeah, but the, but what I what I need to. And it's going to piss off a lot of these people. But I still see Filipino martial arts people and Salat guys who are guilty as hell of this. I mean, you can look on YouTube and see this. They're like, it's a demonstration. Well, that's fine if you're showing it. But then you have to show the application phase. And they never show the application phase. I mean, uh, when I went through training, you know, with Mike, there was a big, you're doing the pads, then you're doing the whatever and then there's an application phase and you weren't coordinated until you could do it in the application phase because being on pads is one thing and the yeah. reality is a whole different level you know yeah. and i never have you ever seen any of those filipino martial arts guys or salat guys which i'll leave out that whole to talk about how they're so confused in the United States right now about that stuff. But have you seen any of those guys ever in a real in a in, against a resisting combat speed opponent? Have you ever seen them? You know, do it. Have you ever seen oh, any of them? You know, my only true experience with that is one student I have in particular who's been training for a really long time, who really got into this a lot for quite a while. You know, and you know that footwork thing that supposedly developed because they're in slippery jungle yeah. and they have to step behind themselves behind their foot they have to step behind you know that step behind move that step over tree roots and whatnot well i said there ain't any fucking tree roots okay and he, he would do that every time he would step behind i just rush in and, and palm slap him in the chest and knock him down every time because he's trying to force a weird kind of footwork that when you're on stable terrain doesn't make any sense at all and I would yeah. knock him down, and he trained yeah. the shit out of this. Knock him and, down, every time. trip him over his own leg. Yeah, and that would be in real, real fighting. That would have been the death of him. That because then it's e easy. It's e if 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 I if I put someone on the ground, it's easy for me to kill them. And I am not covering how that's done here. I'm not going to say that. Lots of people want that free training. No, and will I give out that training to you if you come to me? No, not initially. Hell no. <laughs> Tell but him how many pounds of pressure it takes though it ain't yeah, much it's not much it's not much and there's a, there's a bunch of, there's, there's some stuff and it's easy it's very easy to do and uh, yes, I mean that's why I want to let's harp on this <laughs> horizontal grappling in battlefield conditions uh, or mob situations which is violence oh. is death it's suicide it's, it's suicide death. yeah it's death. 
Now people are like, well, but this guy, I'm one. Yeah, one on one, where there's no obstacles, the ground is clear. There's, 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 there's no weapons to be had. I mean, none at all. Nothing. I mean, I'm not even talking about sand. You can jam the guy's nose. Yeah. <laughs> because, I mean, people, they don't know. You know, they didn't even, they never even thought of it. Those BJJ guys have never thought of that. And so I put a handful of sand in your mouth and your nose. You, you know what the reaction is going to be? To clear that the hell out. You know what I'm saying? And then there's, there's a big opportunity. But my point being is that we are – concentrating on extreme violence and real fighting. We're not talking about sport fighting. It's And that, that's like saying, hey, you know, that guy's a great ping pong player. Well, does that mean he's a great tennis player? No, it, it doesn't, you know? They both have a ball and a net and a paddle, but it doesn't mean they're the same, or a racquetball, you know? It's, everything, yeah. changes. everything changes. And if you're used to a racquetball court, and then you're like, well, wait, I can't hit it off the walls here at the tennis court. Yeah, you can't, you know? So you got to be like what you're saying is you've got to be applicable to your environment. And then yeah, I got a good one for you. This really happened about four years ago. You know, where you found me to website at that Aikido dojo where you found me and tracked me down. Yeah. Okay. I was in there and I'd done a class and you know, there used to be an Aikido's kids class that, that would happen right after my class in the morning. Okay. So there'd be people gathering and, They'd be watching us, and I got a few students out of that, actually some of the parents. However, one guy comes in and sits down, a younger guy, really fit. You know, you can just tell. I mean, a guy's athletic. He looked at me. I thought, this guy's some kind of martial artist or something. And he sat there the whole time intensely focused on us. So I knew he wasn't part of these kids' parents group, right? Everybody is there, okay? They're just hanging out. We finish class, though, and this guy keeps waiting for me. And I thought, okay, this guy might just – he's going to rush me or he's going to do something. He had this look on him, right? My guys leave. I'm packing up some stuff. And the guy says, sir, excuse me a minute. He goes, I, I watch what you guys are doing, and I like some of that. He goes, but, I, you know, it just – I don't I, – I didn't see anything in there, and it might just be what you were doing today, but how, I don't – how would – I don't think you could stop me coming in to take you to the ground. I said, oh. And I thought about what we had done. I said, yeah, I could see why you didn't see anything like that in this class. And he goes, can we try it? And I'm like, sure. Now, this is a valuable thing about what you train and how your awareness is based on that. I said, whenever you're ready, he rushes in, you know, takes me down. And then, he's, then he puts a, a, a one-hand choke, does the classic raise to punch me, and then he stops. And he says, well, you didn't do anything. And I said, are you sure? Are you positive I did nothing? He goes, yeah, I could kill you right now. I said, you think so, huh? He goes, well, yeah, what's wrong with you? And I, and I, and then I said, oh, you, he goes, what's that? What's that? Turned around, looked down at his right kidney and saw the knife that I opened and put right in his freaking kidney. So I let him take me down. I knew what I was going to do before he took me down and I suckered his dumb ass. Put a knife in his kidney. And that well, guy, a light bulb went off. He said, I never even thought. Yeah, well, even that's the point. To me. Possibility. I said, that's the point, kid. Yeah, that's the point. And the thing is, in, in real fighting, you don't get to go home and learn about it. You just you pay the ultimate. Uh, yeah, in, in real fighting, you don't get to take uh, notes and have film of it and go home and study it. You you die. So you have to be very sure of what you're doing. And uh, that was a bait. You did a bait on the guy. Yeah. <laughs> but, but this is something. By draw. Remember yeah. attack by draw. <laughs> yeah. 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 The uh, BJJ guys are very guilty of not thinking outside of their BJJ box. And uh, this is something that I have to deal with in the my when I start dealing with counter violence stuff. Because everyone's like, well, isn't the MMA and BJJ the answer? Isn't it the greatest thing? No, because you don't you're not considering weapons or environmental situations. Or multiple guys, yeah, yeah. A, host, a host of things that are going to happen. You cannot just try to go to the ground. You cannot just try to go to the ground. Uh, it's not. It's just not going to work. You know. At, I, know in every, I know a guy right now. I got to tell you this too. I know a guy right now because this is real stuff. This <laughs> just happened in the last year. He's he's crippled. 
he a very good local guy, an MMA fighter. Okay. And um, he tried to go outside to get in his car and go to work. And some jackass parked in front of his driveway. And it's one of those city streets around here in St. Louis where, you know, the cars are bumper to bumper and there's no way like to drive across his front yard or leave out of his driveway. He, so he realizes that this was a guy visiting his neighbor. Goes over and knocks on the door. He says, hey, buddy, can you move your car? Man, I got to get to work. And you're parked right in front of my driveway. He didn't come on like an asshole, you know. And uh, so uh, the guy says, fuck off. I'm busy. And he says, you need to get your fucking ass out here right now and move your car, you know. So the guy comes blasting out of there. And um, so the guy comes on next door and he uh, he starts posturing. He starts gesturing. He starts coming at the guy. Well. This MMA guy takes him to the ground. Beautiful, perfect takedown. He's on top of him and he's popping him. Then all of a sudden, boom, he gets blasted in the neck from behind. Guess what? It was the guy he was visiting, came out the door. Our boy uh, who did the beautiful takedown and all, didn't even see him, wasn't paying any attention. This guy kicked him in the back of the neck and this guy's fucked up and still, he's crippled. Yeah. He didn't treat Took his yeah. just shut his awareness up. He was in the training mode of I'm in I'm in the ring. I'm you know and wasn't thinking. Hey, I'm outside, man. This is the real environment. Anything can happen out here. Yeah. This, these things are important for people to think about. You know they got to well, know this. It it's missing a, a huge component, uh, which is something that JKD is not specifically taught, but you and I have arrived there, and and that is you need a strategy. And you need tactics and techniques alone, which is what you learn in most martial. You learn techniques in martial arts classes. You learn techniques in, in BJJ classes. You don't learn about strategy because that's a higher level skill. And basically, most people don't know a thing about it. Like all these instructors, they don't know about strategy. They have no clue. And I'm not. I'm not talking about you. Go out there and you beat his ass. That's not a strategy. That is not a strategy. You have got a strategy about your environment. Uh, strategy are people like Alexander the Great, Spartacus, who pulled off uh, wins against the Roman legions, uh, Hannibal, Chesty uh, uh, Puller in uh, World, I think World War II, right, or the Korean yeah, War. Yeah, Pacific Theater, Marine, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and uh, those, I mean, that's just some, there's more. They are not people like Custer. <laughs> They're not, you know, and this is something most people don't have because Martial arts instructors don't know strategy. They don't know how to teach. They teach people techniques. Techniques will not get you all the way there. That doesn't work. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the failure of techniques. And people are saying, well, your technique was wrong. You did this. No, your strategy probably was wrong. Like we're, what we're talking about before when we're saying, hey, you shouldn't be high kicking. And they're like, oh, your technique's just not good enough. Or you shouldn't be trapping. Your technique, no, it's the wrong strategy. That's what we're saying. We're And we're saying, and this is a high-level free information right here. We're saying at the, at the level that you should go to with JKD is that you should have a strategy against each person that you see or, or every situation that you run into. Like you get, you know, and I, and I don't want to go into these stories because I would like the other people who were involved at the time to be in these stories. So that's say that for, uh, I'll say that for a later time, but let me tell you that I had guys that I trained in strategy and when we happened to actually get in some group fights and they did exactly what their role was. They, now if you get three guys who are BJJ trained and they get in a fight, they don't have a role. They're all fighting individually as BJJ guys. They don't operate as a unit. They don't operate as well. There's three of us, and we should, you know, they don't have a clue. And this is something that I teach later on. It's not you come in the first day, you're not getting it, you know, uh, because you gotta, you gotta, found, you gotta get a foundation. You gotta get a foundation. And you gotta prove. It. And it's the same sort of thing you're talking about too at a higher, higher, higher level. And the same thing that you pulled on the guy was the strategy. You didn't beat him. He tried a technique on you. And you had a strategy against him. That's why you were successful. You know, he was thinking technique. He was thinking double leg, probably, right? He was probably thinking double leg. And yeah, you had he was a strategy. Low. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's what he was doing. And you had a strategy. 
Yeah. And you had a hey, strike. by the way, yeah. all that, all that was from Michael Sandlin. That when I was with him, that was the key focus was on on that type of strategic work. That I was in a, he was in that phase back when I was tra started training with him in the early seventies, and man, it was that valuable stuff. We spent more time on that than we did on on actual any kind of technique or work. I mean, but my situation was different though because Stan and I were doing that four and five times a week. He would give that out. We go do that on our time. But when I was actually with Mike, it was. He was really focused on on this type of strategic work and this way of looking at, at, at things and, and figuring out situations. And that was, I think, the best stuff I ever got out of any martial art, really, ultimately, as far as survival skills, because that that got it cooking, man. And, and that's that's like super valuable. You know, yeah. Who else was doing that? <laughs> well, that's exactly. You, yeah, you just said it there at the, at the last part. Who else is doing that? That is why we've always been the different branch of JKD than anybody else. That's why uh, Dan said to Mike, I don't have your fighting experience in the street. I don't want to have that fighting experience in the street. Yeah. You definitely know what you're talking about in that aspect. And that's why, and that's who we learned from, you know, that's who taught us. That's who I had to yeah. deal with every day, you know, four hours a day, six days a week. And that is a strategy, like you're saying, the strategy was more important, the techniques were secondary to that. It, yeah. To the strategy. Time. Yeah. And that's what and we've alluded to it in the past by saying, I don't care if I hit you with a chalkboard. <laughs> you know, it, it it doesn't matter what I use, it's the strategy. It's the it's more important than the strategy. And that's something that's uh we're talking about the rise and fall of JKD. So the rise of JKD is this mental process. And now the combat JKD branch, which is very small, that, that you and I are in and that Stan and Norm are in, and not very many others, uh, is this group that had strategy. Because I've never seen Vunak or Hartzell or, or, or Tom Cruise or a billion of these other guys that came later or uh, Terry Gibson when he was alive, they never talked strategy. I've never seen them talk strategy with anybody. I've never heard, you know, I've never heard them bring it up, you know? Uh, so it, it's a, it's what leaves us in a different place than the other JKD people. That's, uh, that's something that's, uh, that they can get if they're, like I said before, if you're around the St. Louis area and you want to get that, you can get it, from Ken, you go to Ken and he will train you. Now for me, you can get part of that through DVDs with me. Of course, you can get it with personal training and seminars, which I'm available to do, I should say that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because we don't talk about that. And of course, that's my my major website. I have other websites, but that's my major website. And that's easy to remember. <laughs> uh, but the, the point being is that uh, this is something that can help everybody. Strategy is something everybody needs. and like. Our, our illustrations of that with the BJJ guys or the wrestler who try to take you down clearly shows the need for strategy. And the same thing with what I was uh, saying earlier with the Spartacus against the Legions or Hannibal or Alexander the Great. Those guys, if you study how they won uh, wars or battles that they were not supposed to win. I mean, even outnumbered and stuff, uh, out uh, it had – the other side had more weapons. They still from strategy. It sure to hell wasn't from technical. Yeah. You know. Uh, so uh, I mean, uh, that's weird. But anyway, yeah, we're see, we're see, we're still dealing with this because we're on two different continents. We should we should tell people that we're the only uh, people that I know who are who are actively uh, giving you information from two continents from from North America and from Southeast Asia. Well, Asia, but Southeast Asia, and uh, we are giving you the facts and the, and the beginning. And I think that uh, we sh you should uh, give a little bit of a clue how much of an eye opener uh, JKD was to you though, when you, when you first went to it, because I think that's something that's missing with the people nowadays. Yeah. Like we were saying before, it's so easy to get information now. It's so easy to look at so many videos and uh, which didn't exist to us. Books. No, and I'm glad you brought that up because this, this is my story on that's perfect. And I'll keep it short. <clears throat> I started out, like, like a lot of guys do here, the first thing they get exposed to is good old straight ahead high school, you know, junior high, high school wrestling. That's where I started. 
And I still consider that to be valuable. And I started that in 69, all right? Um, I was mediocre at best, but I was in shape. And that, that training gave me perspective because more guys back then, in those days, if they had training in anything, in those days, think back how far that is, it was that. They were, it was that or boxing. And it was probably wrestling three or four times to one, uh, wrestling over boxing training here in the States, okay, in most areas. So it was valuable. Now, here was my experience. I'm in high school. I'm a senior. They, these Okinawan karate people come in, a couple. They're, I think they're third dons, both of them, second or third. They do a phenomenal, impressive demo. They knew how to put on a demonstration. They had the nunchucks going, you know, and, uh, and that was the year that we saw Bruce do that on Enter the Dragon just a little later, which is interesting. I saw it first Okinawan, then I see it a few months later when that movie comes out, right? So I'm blown away. I'm like, wow, these guys are fast. Wah! You know, crazy kicks and punches. So I go to their dojo in Belleville, which is 11 miles from where I grew up in college. Go up to Belleville. I get in the class. I'm in there. About six weeks in, they say, you know, you're, you're, doing, you're doing good. You're doing good, and you're really focused and committed in that. We have these open workouts on a Saturday, you know, and you're invited. I'm like, oh. I go to one, and I'm like, you know, we're, we're, we used to do the pound the Makawara boards wrapped in hemp rope and the bloody knuckles and all that crazy stuff. And so, you know, um, I get in there, and um, there's one guy in particular. He's a nice guy. He's like in his 30s. He's been doing this stuff for decades, right? And I'm sitting there going, I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking, I guess if I rush, I came in for a takedown. I guess maybe that front snap kick to my face or something. I wonder I, what would they, you know, what would these guys do, you know? And so here already, you know, I'm looking like you did. I'm like, you know, I, I want to know what works. That's what I cared about. So I asked this guy, you know, if we can we can play around. He goes, sure. And so I come in, I get my little my little wrestling teeter step, and I fake a little, fake a little. He throws a couple kicks. Then I rush in, boom, bam, get him. I take him in a single leg takedown. I take him down. And I'm thinking, I guess I got lucky. And he's, you know, his feathers were a little ruffled, but he got back up and he goes, wow, huh. Then I see him thinking, right? So I thought, uh-oh, <laughs> he's going to do something sneakier, right? So I just naturally started going in and out more and faking like I was going to go for a take. Finally, he, I think he threw, a, threw an overhand chop. And I went under that and I got I went into a beautiful fireman's carry. I actually took this guy down <laughs> off of a chop. Bam, and I slammed it. Hardwood floor, right? And those guys didn't practice falling much, you know, <laughs> especially not on hardwood. Bam, the guy hits the floor. And uh, I apologize. I, you know, I just came out of flow, right? And I said, okay. But, but here again, already, see, the wheels were turning like, yeah. I see a problem with this because I know there's, there's way more guys out here wrestling, and I'm not that good. Then there are guys doing this, right? Luckily, a year later is when I hear some something, wham, 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 banging the hell out of something in a library basement at SIU Edwardsville. And I look down, there's a skinny little black dude down there, and he's got one of the big football dummies, those tackle dummy things, big canvas suckers, weigh, I don't know, what, 200 pounds, hanging from a chain in the basement, and throwing a, and I go, that looks like Bruce Lee's freaking sidekick. And I run down there, and it was Stan <laughs> down there. And yeah. then luckily, I ran into him within a year of the karate thing. And then next thing you know, we're trained a couple months later. I, I meet Mike for the first time. Hey, don't you think that, don't you think that it's that, that uh, analytical scientific mind searching, looking for better answers that led you to JKD? Cause I, yeah, yeah. Without a doubt, there's an intuitive aspect and a personality type that leads you there. But I think more guys were like that than not. Who had you combine a little bit higher IQ than average, maybe, with people who are truly trying to learn? They're not just trying to memorize information, they're trying to learn. And learning means learning a process to continue to learn. Yeah. To me, that's right. that's the higher level, right? Yeah, I agree with that. And uh, I, from for me, you know, I was going through all these different martial arts, and I just knew that something else was better out there. And I knew that, yeah, you know, you're supposed to do this this way in this art, but the other art says, no, do it a different way. And it's like, I was just looking for who accepted what worked. And, and that leads you, of course, I mean, it wasn't, I couldn't find boxing, you know, I, where I was at most of the time, there were no boxing clubs. I wasn't in an urban city and I yeah. didn't, you know, there weren't boxes or I would have gone to a boxing gym much earlier in my, in my career. 
Uh, there was one when I was eight, and I hitchhiked when I was eight years old and went there, and it put me in a ring. Yeah. And I was like an animal. You know, I just would, went crazy. My dad got pissed and, you know, wouldn't wouldn't take me back there anymore. For one thing, because I hitchhiked there when I was a little kid. <laughs> but uh, and I did some Taekwondo in a Japanese art called Yensei Ru, too, in between the uh, – the show and Rue and uh, and meeting Mike, but it was it was so similar. It wasn't almost worth mentioning. I mean, everything they did was very similar, you know. But but what I what I'm getting at was like boxing is the only place uh, that you found like if it worked contact worked, contact, contact like, yeah it worked for you it was fine. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like if it yeah. worked for you it was fine. And whereas if you were in these traditional martial arts, they're like, no, you got to do it this way. And actually, that's Muay Thai in in Thailand. By the way, they want you to look like a certain type of fighter, and they, and they because they got millions of guys in this country, and their and their cookie cutter approach works percentage wise with a small percentage of people here, and they still produce people. They think, well, it's the best way. It's not the best way. It's not sports science. Uh, no, so, they're fighting each other too, and they're doing the same thing. They're all yeah, doing the same yeah, thing. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, I mean that's a whole nother episode about other other aspects, but the the point being is that if you have this searching for the truth uh, personality and that you're really interested in advancing yourself and not being stuck to the past or some traditional or invested art that you that you can you have to let your like the you know that saying to climb higher you have to let go of your grip <laughs> right you have to let go of where you're at <laughs> you know. You have to you have to change your you have to change your hand position. You know you have to let go of this this space. Sure, sure. And that if you're that sort of person who's open minded, I actually mean open minded, not some cliche open mind. I mean if you're open minded, then this process that we're talking about is vastly important to you, and you should search it out. And there aren't that many play. And I'm telling you, like we were talking about, uh, a lot of the people. Well, in Filipino martial arts, I've seen it. It's traditionalized. It, it you can't you can't do it your way, really. You, they won't let you do it your way, they, and they'll get angry with you because they still got that master and servant uh, entire framework going. And Salat, because unless you're a Muslim, you're really not going to learn Salat, real Salat. You're going to learn this whatever somebody says is Salat, but it's also on this patterns and you must do this this way and that way which is done what bruce said you should not do is is make it dead right that was it fixed patterns are dead patterns and it's not anything other than that so and i found like you said why you got angry with dan at one point was that those other jkd guys were becoming fixed pattern guys and that's definitely what you see with these guys who Trying to do what Bruce did in 1969 or 1970. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, they're still there. They 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 have not walked on, brother, as he wrote. Walk and on. They, yeah, they don't have his body. They don't have his mentality, and they're trying to copy him. And oh god, especially big guys. They cannot fight like Bruce. It's Hell. just it's ridiculous, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I Hartzell was smart in the fact that he didn't go down the same. He didn't try to do it the same way. That uh, everyone else, was doing it, you know, because he I really. Before, I like Larry. I only spent about four hours with him in California back in the early eighties, but yeah. he was different. He was closer to our mentality than any of those other guys I talked to. That's one of the things I really liked and respect. And he had a ass butt load of street fight experience too. I can tell you. Yeah. You know the story about what Bruce liked to use Larry for. Fight challenges. Yeah. Well, you know, Larry wasn't isn't that wasn't that big actually. They always said he was big. He no, wasn't no. big. Stocky guy. He wasn't very big. Yeah. No. He was I think I, he taller now. Yeah. Yeah, you know, he wasn't that big, you know. I mean, re and re realistically, he wasn't that big. He was bigger than those other guys. But yeah. you know, I mean, but he realized he couldn't be like Wong. You know, he couldn't be like Wong. He couldn't be like uh uh, uh who's the guy in San Francisco still? That uh, uh, Taki uh, Kimura. He couldn't be like Taki. He couldn't be like Taki Kimura. He couldn't be like Ted Wong. He couldn't be like uh, Dan and Asanto, because that was not his body size. And so he 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 transitioned to some other aspects, and uh, that is important. And so what, what I'm saying is that you got people who who are confused 
they're confusing as you said before they're imitating and confusing it for the process because the process right. the process is more important than than imitating and, and imitation yeah. it's like you know like in japan okay japan uh doesn't create a lot of new music but they sure the hell imitate you know oh they can imitate anything perfectly uh anything from manufacturing cars to you know yeah, uh, they have an interesting knack within their national psyche about their abilities in that area. It's interesting. Yeah, well, you know, like in music, they you know all these Elvis impersonators. They have all these Japanese Elvis impersonators. They have this this girl group that's called Baby Metal. These girls are pretty cute, and they're doing you know heavy metal uh, with a little bit of pop, you know, and they're they're popular with a certain segment. But the thing is, they really have never they have ne they've never come up with their own style of music that's impacted the world i've only uh, seen in, one in, i've seen one and i and i and i watch her and listen to her frequently yeah. hiromi koihara hiromi Wehara, though would be not be your favorite because she's a jazz keyboard player oh, yeah, get that out of here stop that now wow. I this know can't go one episode <laughs> without some jazz talk you know what i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> that cat is cool. That cat is cool. <laughs> you, know? Uh, I, you, know, you know, I think uh, if. Uh, <laughs> oh, dude, that's going to trip your head. <laughs> when we do the. We do the I, I think uh, my part, if we get this thing going on with the, you know, the combined seminar thing, going, mine's going to be Death to Jazz JKD. That's what oh, my. God. Death to Jazz that's JKD. You know, I mean, God, God, you know, I know Stan, Stan, Stan looks like a jazz guy. I mean, you know, you know, yeah, I, Stan, is, Stan is actually more kind of a symphonic. Oh, yeah. Kind of. Oh, good. Yeah. And, 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 and no, uh, uh, Jefferson Airplane was his favorite group. through the Oh, 70s. yeah. Oh, wow. That's weird. Uh, huh? Yeah, it is weird. Yeah. What What about Norm? Was he leaning? Is he jazz? Or what, what is he? He's a jazz boy. But he's like yeah. me. He's He's picky about the jazz he likes. It's, it's okay. got to, it does have to be melodic and it does have to be not Stanley just a Clark. He's like Cornette Stan Coleman masturbation on an instrument is, yeah, is what Stan I call it. Yeah, 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 okay. Anyway, I'm going to have to have a talk. I'm going to have to have a talk with you guys. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I made more money, I made more money in bands yeah. when I started playing out, playing uh, Rolling Stones, Steppenwolf. Yeah, all that kind of crap. And I used to play one particular biker bar. We made a fortune playing in that place in the day. They paid well, but you yeah. had to play that stuff all night. Get your motors running, head out on the highway. Oh, yeah, gonna gonna make it happen. Yeah, uh, yeah. Do that flash one more time. Oh my God. Ah. Anyway, <laughs> but it was uh, still fun. It was exciting, man. Bottles yeah. flying across the room. That got me in some fights. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Oh. That'll happen. The uh, but but uh, but to come back to the JKD because we get sidetracked on our music musical differences. Yeah, yeah. But and it we, relates in a way. It does relate mentality wise and stuff in ways. I think. Yeah, yeah. No, it, there's a, for musicians you can make some analogies that they'll get because I've I've wow. trained I've trained some musicians and I've made some music things. They're like, oh yeah, I get it. You know, I understand that now. It's like, yeah, other people don't get it, but. You know that's the whole point. The, I, that's what we should uh, talk about here at the very last uh, for this segment is that JKD uh, done the real way is a very specific process that's unique to the person that you teach, and you have to yeah. get it across. Yeah. And there's something. Uh, although I train military guys, which I like to do, I'll say it over and over again. If, you, if you're military, I, I want to train you. If you're a military, represent any military unit. I really love to train the unit, but. I train those guys a certain way because they're used to a certain type of training. However, that's very uh, segment. It's very uh, it's very sequential structured. But when you get when you're training a person, you have to learn that person, don't you, Ken? And you yeah. have to. Oh, you got to get into their psyche, man. You really do because we're back to what you said earlier. What what works for one doesn't work for the other. You can't be 250 pounds, six foot five, and try to do what Bruce Lee did the way he did it. It ain't gonna work, you know. By the same token, you have to approach every guy differently. That's why I mentioned this to you earlier. I, I like seven students in my class. Seven plus me makes eight. I can keep training partner groups even, you know, 
two guys, and I can mix and match people easily with them, even numbers like that. And that's about max for spending enough one-on-one -on -one time with each guy. Yeah. That maxes well, me out. You know. you're, 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 really running, you're really running a semi-private classes, really. Yes, absolutely. That's specific. And, and I do workshops maybe every two months. And you yeah. know, sometimes I'll have 10, 12. There have been times I'll have 40 guys in one of those. And that's, that's ridiculous. You know, that's too many you know, for what I do, but yeah, but the, but the, what I, I don't want people to be discouraged because you're, you got slots open. That's what I'm still saying. you got, cause you got other oh, days. Yeah. You're not, you're not, that's yeah. not, that's not a class every day of the week right now. So you got, I don't well, want and people, I encourage people to, to well, just get a money and come and do private lessons and then they have a training yeah, partner. And they yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. really great. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want people to get discouraged and say, well, no. he's only no. got, you know, I, yeah. The, the point is that you're saying that you're, you're making sure that people learn and a, a lot of people right. don't care about that. You know, a lot of people, and that's one of the things like you go to BJJ seminar, my God, you'll have a hundred people. You'll have a hundred people and then they do it for two hours. You're not learning anything for two in two hours. You're, yeah. you're getting shown stuff. Big deal. You know, I mean, not to harp just on them. They're not the only ones doing that. But uh, what we're talking about here is that, JKD is a process. It's a mental application of analytical skills. And that's why Bruce made a big uh, break from everybody else, right? I mean, originally, that's what his, his biggest invention was that, Innov an innovation was that, that he was breaking away from the traditionalist mode. And he was going to look empirical. He was doing empirical research, which is very Western, you know, he, and, yeah. and that's really was his, his guiding philosophy, right? Which is our guiding philosophy too. We want well, empirical. Yeah, but it's interesting when you consider the source, and we talked about this earlier, and these guys need to hear this, right? We talked about this, right? If you want to really conceptually get into Bruce's mind, read J. Krishnamurti. Oh, yeah. And I would say particularly read the, the Awakening of Intelligence. If you pick one book, read that one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad you brought that up because I almost completely forgotten about that. We should say that I had talked about that if you're this sort of person, you'll gravitate towards wanting to learn uh, the JKD process and mindset. But there are these other books like you just brought up. Krishnamurti is a great, uh, he's not, he's not coming at it from some sort of dogma. There's no dogma. Absolutely none whatsoever. <laughs> the opposite. Yeah. Yeah, he's not, He, in fact, well, people can look up his history, but he rejected, he was supposed to be the golden boy. He yes. was supposed to be the golden boy, he refused he to. Trained. He was trained, yeah. Yeah, he, he was trained. Yeah. And so he does not, he doesn't represent Christianity, he doesn't represent Hinduism, he doesn't represent even Buddhism, which are ideologies, which is an ideology. He doesn't represent that, he represents a rational mind. Yes. Yeah, he's rationalism. He's 19th century rationalism. Really, really, I mean, that's where he fits into. And that's a very important uh, thing. Uh, as If you follow us more and watch us more, we'll be talking about other people that you can get into and, and read about. But he influenced Bruce a great deal. That's something that, that I don't hear anybody else really talking about, you know. Now and then, in... 20 years ago, you might have heard someone bring it up. Dan might have brought it up, you know. Uh, but that's the key thing because we're not we're not saying you can't foster this mindset because we were talking before as if you already had it. But you can foster this mindset by having uh, influences like reading Krishnamurti, for one, and, and starting to analyze every situation you're in. That's a key. Uh, that skill, if you develop that skill, like – I know you wanted to say this too, right? But I, you probably forgot about uh, the JKD mindset applied to business. Yes. Yeah. I, I started two businesses that were successful, although, you know, we didn't expect the second Great Depression to hit in the, around 08 or 09 when it did here. And 2008. Unfortunately, yeah. the, the industries that were hit the hardest were real estate and banking, which tied into what, what I did at the time. So I did have to shut down at that point. However, People couldn't believe how well I could have started, managed, and ran my businesses. And, and where did, how did you get this? You studied psych and philosophy and then TV and radio production. How do you learn that? And I said, no, oh, it's all JKD. It was yeah. very conscious that that's 
where I got my strategic abilities on even how I managed people. Even in jobs before I ever had that, it all came. I got more from that than I did from anything directly that I learned in college, as far as relating it to business. Yeah, it was that yeah. same mentality. So, the takeaway there for people who are bullet point minded is that it, the JKD process is applicable to other areas of life. Bingo. Very, and 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 that uh, it's a framework that that is part of our. I guess psyches at this point, part of our personalities, definitely. And did we have it before we started JKD? Yeah, we were starting to, but did it gel it in us? Did it did it increase it? Did it magnify it? Yes, it certainly did. And Mike Salen will either magnify it in you or <laughs> or or you or you don't make it, right? I mean, you know, I mean, we made it. So obviously it got magnified. And I and I really should, you know. I really need to say that more and more because there are a lot of people who are in JKD who are seminar trained by watered down people who are seminar trained, blah, blah, blah. All right. That's better than nothing. But man, we were trained in the, in the special forces level. You got to prove yourself constantly. You're tested. You had to fight. You had to do this. You had to do that. And, and that's why there's so few of us. Because Mike is not an easy guy to get along with, number one. I'll just throw that out there. And number two, the training emotionally, psychologically, is incredibly difficult. Uh, physically, if you're in shape at all, you can handle it. But, but, the, but the emotional, psychological, overcoming your ego, right, uh, Ken? I mean, that's what we should say. That's and you have and you got to keep doing that over and over and over again, too, you know? Because you have to keep doing like we do, and you still got to go out there and go to other things. I mean, I was just in Toronto in January with a bunch of guys. A lot of these guys are some hardcore Russian dudes who that's all they've ever done is train their whole lives. And, you know, I've been, been doing this stuff for, what, 47 years. I had to take the ego hat off and hang it on the nail and go in there and be open, you know, to like, well, what are these guys going to do? You know, there's always more to learn. I don't care who you are or what you do, you know. So, well, there's, yeah, there's willing some, to do that a lot. Well, yeah, there's some, there's, well, there's, some, there's certain, there's certain things. There's always some part to learn something else. You might already yeah. have, you might already have your skill set, you know, right. Yeah, it's not going to change, but, but I know, but what you're talking about is you had to psychologically come up because Russians who've grown up in a harsh environment have a strongly strong will. And this is another part of it. It's you know, in professional fighting, and this is part of the Soviet Eastern Bloc stuff. It's skill and will, skill sure. and will, and those yeah. guys have all got will beyond what the hell a normal person has. So oh yeah, you and you see it in ten minutes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you get the vibe. You get the vibe when you walk in the room. Actually, yeah, yeah. You know, the cool thing is, every one of those guys had their shit together. They were wired tight, man. High skills. Yeah. Fantastic shape. And yet these guys were gentlemen who were yeah. there and to, so that everybody could learn and work together. And, and it, it, it's impressive to get that many guys at that level because these guys are like mostly are all these instructors that have been doing this stuff for a long time. Right. Yeah. And uh, man, I never seen such a such a huge group of guys at that level who kept their egos completely under control. That yeah. in itself is pretty amazing. That yeah. many guys in one room at that level to see how cool they really were was like, that yeah. alone was inspirational. Impressive. Very impressive. That's cool stuff, you know. I mean, that's cool. But the, the, we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves there. I mean, we're giving – we're, yeah. we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves because we're, we're, we're saying what we do now. And, and we're yeah. really – we're trying to lead people on a, uh, uh, on a journey right now. Yeah. And, yeah. And, people, yeah. and, people, and people are probably saying, well, you know – it's not that controversial right now. Well, it was during the '60s and this and the, the when Bruce was doing it. This was highly controversial. This was why he it still was. Is. It still is. Yeah. Well, yeah. It still we is. We just but, describe what most people are still doing. Oh, that's yeah. And what I've said is definitely. I've already pissed off probably like 300 uh, Filipino people and and Salat practitioners. Uh, I, I, I guarantee what I said pissed them off, you know, that they're upset. You don't understand us. No, I do exactly understand you. This is my life. This is what I've been doing, you know. The, uh, but what I want to say is that when we go to our next segment, because we're going to move from Bruce established this 
to Bruce started because we just talked about Bruce really himself. We talked a little bit about uh, Larry Hartzell just because it fit into the flow. But we're going to get into he trained people and then the seminar, the seminar period, which you were a crucial. You were a crucial part of that with the California Martial Arts Academy in the United States. You were crucial in the seminar uh, circuit and also the, the majority of people who got in contact with uh, JKD and Filipino martial arts did it through the seminar circuit back back in the 80s and it backfired. 90, you, know yeah. how, you know how it backfired, right? You yeah. know what that was intended? And Dan in the sound, I believe he says this to this day, if I'm not mistaken. And he was clear about this. The whole point of the whole seminar thing was to expose you to people that would be hard to get for you to get one on one exposure to right in these different arts. The idea was for that to inspire you to go do what Dan did. Now you go track these guys down and you go train with them like I did. I'm going to show you 30 different arts over the course of a week. I'm going to give you some exposure. I'm not training you. I'm exposing you to it. Okay. Now you go out, you pick what, what resonates with your personality. It might be one or two or three. Now that's where, to me, Dan was more JKD-ish in his mentality. He's laying this all out. Take what, what you think works for you. What are you drawn to intuitively? Now you go out and do what I did. You go, you go spend the night in your car, drive 200 you know, miles away, spend a night in your car, and you go train with John LaCrosse for, for two days and then, and then go take a shower in a gas station bathroom and go back home to your classes or whatever, you know? That's what he was trying to do. People misunderstand what Dan's goal was. Dan was to expose you to this stuff. Dan's yeah. a pres preservationist. He wasn't trying to really train you. As, and, where, and where it really crashed and burned is just like you keep saying, the guys that think that the seminar training is the training got that wrong. That was to inspire you and kick you off to go out and really immerse yourself, not yeah. to think that the seminars are the training. They're not. Right. But but I think we should break it right there, <laughs> and that because right. that that leads us to part two, which is takes off right there what we're talking about, where people were confused and and let down, and also what we think of seminar trained <laughs> instructors, and this is also leads us actually the seminar is what leads us to the fall of JKD, and that's what and this will definitely make. It will be controversial, and it will irritate, and it will really make angry all those guys out there with their certificates that they got from seminars and became instructors only by going to seminars, which there's a load of those guys. And uh, we guarantee – so, I mean, there's a lot here. Ken and I have, uh, uh, have uh, covered quite a bit, so watch this uh, as soon as it goes up on YouTube, which will be in a couple minutes. You can re you can watch it again. Play your favorite parts over and over. <laughs> and I gotta say again that uh, Ken offers a free lesson to you for, uh, if you can stop his. Uh, is it uh, your punch or your hit? What what are you what are you, what are you using? I could call that an eye jab, but I don't hit you in the eye. I hit you both. Okay. In the All right. He's, I'll he's just slap you on the head. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> if he and does, I, I have slow now. But you know the eye as well as I do. It's actually yeah. not about the speed. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we don't want to give out any secrets here. The, oh, uh, that, that should tantalize right there. Wait, what if it's not about the speed? Well, yeah, then yeah, what yeah. the hell is it? Well, hey, yeah, 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 yeah. One thing I'm going to close with, you, you alluded to, when you brought in logic, you said something about logic in, yeah. in this process earlier. I think a key phrase that's good for people to remember from, from logic is the old Latin, right? Post hoc ergo propter hoc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep, yep. I, I use well, that all the time. You want to translate it? Yeah, you well, it, 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 it means uh, bef uh, after the fact, therefore, before the fact. And, and uh, it's for people who well, I don't understand that. It means uh, confusing the results with, uh, with uh, association. So it's, it's getting things out. Cause and effect uh, is off. Your cause and effect is off. If you, if you, if yeah, you, and in another framework where I would put it is, because we've alluded to this, a lot of traditional martial arts, see, I'm, I'm not trying to diss those guys, because a lot of those guys, they don't care about fighting. They're, they're, not, they're not in the mentality we're into. That's not what they're trying to do. They, they, they study and do what they do for other reasons, and that's cool. But just keep in mind, 
that they may be creating limitations in your abilities in realistic fight situations <laughs> because what you train is what you're going to do. So you got to be careful with that. But what I was alluding to with the post hoc statement too is the idea that that don't believe something's great just because it's been around forever and has all the answers for what you need to know now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. There's, yeah, there's a lot there. The, uh, and I want to say again that, so that, that can is open to students. I'm going to put, I'm open for people who want to uh, do private uh, training or seminars with me. And I also have a lot of DVDs. And I'm going to link, uh, I have my website linked, but I'm going to also link uh, the DVD about Mike Sandlin's actual, how he did JKD, uh, part of how he did JKD, so that those people who have asked me about that, because they've asked me, what about this, uh, you know, Mike Sandlin character? Well, you know, what about him? Uh, we can, <laughs> we're giving you more and more indications about his personality and his traits and how he actually fights. And so that that will be available to people. So it's just as you're saying, as you alluded to, as you actually stated, people need to take the proactive step and start going after this information and not expecting us to spoon feed it to you because we're not covering everything. Now, if when we do our projected thing that we're hoping to do here, maybe in uh, a couple months, if we're lucky, then we will go more in detail with the people who show up. But uh, we're just trying to give you, uh, I guess you call it, we're kind of giving an outline, aren't we, Ken? Uh, when you say this is an yeah. outline of everything. And, and we have a lot of people who are, we have a lot of people who are very uh, uh, interested in everything that we're saying and we're doing. And they want to know, uh, what, what is that? What, what, is, what is it that you're talking about? What is that technique or what is this? Well, that's stuff to, to bring up when you're in a seminar or private training or consultations. I do uh, Skype consultations for people. And. That is not just uh, fighting consultations. That can be on the strategy aspect as far as learning how you should learn strategy. And th that's uh, basically, I think, the first part here is about Bruce Lee came up with a new way of approaching fighting. That, that, I mean, he was the first person in modern times that we were well aware of. That yeah, had well, big media. yeah, he had media exposure. And he was the one who put a new process on the fighting. Had other people done it in the past? Hell yeah, they'd done it. Oh, yeah. But were they known? Were they known? No, they weren't known. So we're going from there. How did Bruce JKD's rise? And we're going to get to, in the second part, of where JKD took over. JKD at one point took over. It was the be all end all, wasn't it, Ken? I mean, it was the solution. People needed to learn something that was effective and was uh, made for real fighting, it was JKD at one point in time. It was the, it was the Kali JKD. You know, remember that period. Uh, well, so I knew what, a lot of the MMA coaches, they openly acknowledge that, that the, the core philosophy, the basic idea of what they're trying to do yeah. is from that philosophy too. Yeah. I mean, but they were, of, well, but their they, thing is more limited. There, it's yeah. more limited because it's a sport, of course. And a lot of those coaches acknowledge that too. Like, hey, look, you know, sure, there's a lot more you can do. But for the sport application, we can't gouge people's eyes and whip knives out and poke them in the kidney. But however, <laughs> you know. Well, uh, they also, <laughs> but, they, but they also don't use the same training that we're doing. Like the well, – they, yeah, they, they can't use, yeah. <laughs> I mean the attribute training. The stuff right. that, the stuff that yeah. we're talking – that we've talking that we talked about before and stuff that we do, like – uh, they're not training people to get faster uh, the right way. And how many I, of them train blindfolded? Yeah, and they're not they're not they're not they're not developing perception and others. That's a byproduct of a guy just fighting, but they're not they don't know how to develop it on its own. We do. That's a big difference about the JKD. Well, our combat that that's something Mike Sandlin in, invented. That is Mike Sandlin's uh, contribution. To this that's why we've always been different because we had specific drills that were made for perception were made for speed were made for distancing were made for uh, reaction all of this stuff was specific to us that we never saw with anybody else never 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 we have stuff no one else has and although I put some of that out 21 years ago on VHS which is still selling you can see parts of that, but there, there's more than what I put out. And, and even that, 
but you need a qualified person to train you in that stuff. You can't just have your brother-in-law show up and try to do that because they don't have the they don't have the building the credentials in the background. It's just like you can have someone come out and try to tell you how to be a better sprinter, but unless they've actually done it and proven that they've been successful at creating speed with people, they're, they're it's just a cheerleader. You know, you know what I'm saying. So there, there's a big difference here. Or, or surgery, for example. You're not going to get a non-surgeon to be able to teach you the intricacies of surgery. It's just, it's not going to happen. Yeah, by the way, way, yeah. I think I have the surgery for the interview of Carl on video. I think I finally have all the background noise, and then it's then it's viewable. Okay. This is pretty good stuff. Also, I have killer footage that was originally on Super 8. I have it on DVD. And this is my teaching. Oh yeah, Dan. <laughs> okay, so we'll we'll keep that. We'll we well, have to we need to talk about that uh, off air about that. Yeah, about yeah, 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 we will. We will. Actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's completely talk about that off air. But we're just gonna. That's good. You have let people know that we got a lot of stuff. We got uh, some stuff. Yeah, yeah, we got a lot of stuff. And plus, I mean, besides our own greatness. Which we should we shouldn't diminish our own greatness. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, I think that's a pretty good episode here. On the- I'm not great. I'm just old and treacherous. See, I wanted to make that clear. I'm just <laughs> treacherous. I ain't great, but I'm treacherous. I'm sneaky. <laughs> yeah, you know, I like to sit around the campfires and, and sing my songs. You know, I like to sing. Go. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so we'll have to do that. We. Uh, and that's well. We'll get into that another time. But I, I just want everyone to know that uh, I guarantee the next episode is the one you don't want to miss because we're gonna get, we're gonna make uh, a lot of people pretty angry. I think pretty angry. Remember, you might get some. I don't. They're not gonna contact me. Probably. I mean, they're not gonna show up to me. I, I. It's too difficult for them to find me over here. But uh, my point being is don't miss the next episode everybody because it's going to be it's going to be more jam packed more thrills more spice I, I should be doing movies huh you know it's just a it's a, twice the excitement but uh i think that uh we covered a pretty good cuz i don't want to we don't want to cover so much that people lose sight of the main th- thrust and the main thrust is that bruce lee used a new process a new paradigm to approach fighting and that that paradigm is applicable to other things besides fighting. But don't get don't see Bruce as the only way to apply that paradigm because we've applied that paradigm differently. You uh, and I both fight differently than Bruce. So it's but that we're still using that operating software. <laughs> this use it in that sense that Bruce had. And the same the thing is that other people are trying to write the same story Bruce wrote, you know, and that's the mistake. And they're also doing things that are not productive. We we're, we're toss out, you and I toss out every non-productive thing. We don't just keep doing it because, it, well, you know, they used to do this. This is like the sidekick, you know, that JKD we're side. Back to, we're back to the post hoc statement here. Yeah, 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 yeah. So don't get, yeah, don't get caught up. Don't get caught up in doing something just because someone else did it. You know, well, it's traditionally blah blah blah. Well, you know, traditionally people had horses, and they were, and they were, you know, different parts of the world were wearing different types of armor. But we are not in that con- same condition right now. Yeah, yeah, if you have armor on, you got to fight, and that's why military guys have to fight differently than than MMA guys. That's yeah, I'll yeah. give that, I'll give that out right now. Oh, that's a free one. You know, whoa, military stuff is yeah, because you're not, you've never done it. You know, you, you, anyway. But my point being is that uh that stay tuned because uh, we're looking for sponsors. <laughs> we we got to make it clear too that what all we're trying to do is inspire people and open them up. Yeah. It's not about, I, I'm not here to put down what people do. It's up to them what they do, you know, and, I, and it's all good. It's all got value. Uh, we're just trying to show people that there's something else. There's another approach. If your goal is to try to be very open and really develop yourself in all ways, combatively, uh, you have to be open-minded about it and that's what we're trying to inspire you your training has to be more complete it can't just be this one thing and the way it was done in 1852 you know uh because a lot of guys they're they're not doing what we do they're not they're not 
training you in the same way, developing the same kind of versatility? Probably. I mean, if, if it's a sport application, it can be great, but there's going to be limitations, just like we've mentioned a hundred times. And a lot of these arts that stay in their traditional niche, that worked for certain people back when, the, you know, when they were fighting off the Spaniards, attacking the beaches on the islands, a lot, that stuff was perfect at the time for that application, but we're in a different application in a different time. So, you know, that, that's what we teach is how to, how to analyze, how to, how to use that process to make what you do more well-rounded and, and realistic for who you yeah. are and where you are now. Absolutely. But part of that, it's something that people don't like to hear because they like to label it negative, but you got to take a hard critical look at what you're doing. That's wrong. What, what yeah. wasting time and what is a stupid thing to do. And you've got to label it stupid. You, you can't say, well, you know, those people, it's okay. No, you've got to, you, it's just like something that's a medicine. You have to think of it in medical or NASA terms, you know, when they're creating space flight and, and creating new vehicles, they don't say, well, you know, that was okay. Let's no, they get rid of it. They say that doesn't work. That that's the wrong thing to use. You get the hell <coughs> you go, you advance by curing your faults. And the only way you cure your faults is not by overlooking them or burying them or being uh, untruthful to yourself. Uh, you must lead the examined life. I'm going to throw some Socrates in there, right? You must lead the examined life. And that means examining what you're doing. If you have not examined your art or your martial art, then you are nothing but a robot and a slave. You've got to break out of the slave mentality. Which yeah, it's about mentality. Yeah, it's about mentality. And this will help you in your life. I mean, Let's face it, most of us ain't out there fighting on the streets unless we're military or cops or work in a psych ward or a prison or whatever. It's about these lessons that are that are that you take out into the world, man. And that's I gave it a big example about starting and running two businesses successfully for years based on that approach. There you have it. Yeah. So with that, I think we should end it because we yeah. have we have a tendency to keep going and going because it leads us for, we get ideas and we get other ideas together. But I just want to keep it on that. So actually, it is coherent. All of our stuff is coherent, but we don't use a script because we like to be real. We like to keep it real, people. And we like uh, – there's a lot of value to what we say. And the people – I had a lot of feedback from people who are looking for this, and they say, man, that's some good stuff you guys say here and there, and da-da-da, and I really want some more. And then other people tell me, that say, well, uh, those guys, man, I don't understand them. Well, you may not be ready for it. It's just like some yeah. level of yeah. mathematics. You may not be ready for what we're talking about yet, but That's very true. you know. But you can come back to it because it's on YouTube. You can come back to it later. And the, the factor is that we cannot be for everybody. But for those who are searching, we're out there trying to help those, who, like you said, who are searching, who are open-minded, or who want to be open-minded, who want to go to a new place, or want to advance themselves, take themselves to another level. Uh, and that's where we're we're at at this point. We're at uh, being teachers, instructors, trainers leaders guides whatever word you want to use that's where we're at at this point where that's what you and I are both doing so we're saying that yeah uh, just like uh, a Lamborghini or a Bugatti is not for everybody it's for a specialized group of people we're there also we're, we're not uh, we're not saying you know if hey you know the people want to do Taekwondo this is it's this for Taekwondo no because if you like Taekwondo we're probably not for you if you're just a sport uh, BJJ guy, then we're probably not for you. But if you want to be more than that, if you want to be more applicable to real life and deal with real situations and real violence and, and uh, situations that are not sport related, then we're got answers for you. We got solutions and we got the, well, we definitely have the training for you. So, uh, I mean, I was a sport, I was a professional fighter for a long time. So it's not, us saying it out of sour grapes. It's me. I was a professional fighter for a long time. So if I'm saying we're training people because they're not getting in a professional fight, you know, they're not getting in the UFC, the normal person. They're not getting in a Muay Thai fight. They're not getting in a Burmese boxing fight. They're not fighting on HBO. They're, you know, they're not doing any of that stuff. So all of those skills are cool. It's great to watch. It's great to do. It's fun to do. I love sport fighting, but a normal person has no need for that. Just like 
you know, it's like if you live in the desert, you don't need a snowmobile. <laughs> so snowmobiles are cool, but if you live in the desert, what are you going to do with a snowmobile? You know, so it, it's the same thing. But uh, Ken and I will be back. We'll be back, and we're gonna we're gonna keep going down this road of the rise and fall of JKD. And we thank those people who've been sending me feedback uh, about everything. And those people have said, "Man, I'm so glad that you went." I a lot of people. Oh, but I need to say that too, Ken. I didn't, I didn't say that. I got a lot of people said, man, I really like that Norm guy. I really like that uh, that Stan guy. You know, I really like that Ken guy. You know, it's like, yeah, cool. Uh, you know, yeah, you guys can thank me because I'm the one that had to go out and find those guys. That's and right, I, man. He worked his butt off. <laughs> yeah. well, you know, I, I, it's really, it's kind of cool. You know, I, and in some way, we never really talked about that, but we, we don't need to do it here. But, it, you know, it was like, it, it was kind of a uh, uh Serendipity, right? That would be the word, huh? Like you were coming out, you wanted to start getting back in, and and I was out looking, and you know, that uh, you know, that's some I sort call of that a combination of uh, conscious intellect and intuition working hand in hand. That yeah, creates these things. Yeah, and if we could only get, yeah, if we could only get Big Head to go jostle Mike, you know, out of uh, out of his complacency. You know how these things work? He may get in a mood. There may be just this time when he gets in a mood and yeah. says, "Yeah, you know what." Yeah, I'll let them guys talk to me, and when Mike will be sitting here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I, my special talk to Big Head, put the bag of chips down, Big Head. Get up and go that 12 miles it is to his, his place and go over there and jab him in the ridge with a, with a damn uh, broom, okay? And say that's, say that's from me. <laughs> say it's from me. But, uh, okay, so anyway, that's it for this episode of uh, – the Lost Boys of JKD taking you on the rise and fall of JKD. Stay tuned for the part two coming up soon. And we'll let, I'll let you everybody know. And thanks to, for support and anybody who has anything that you want to uh, sell on our program, let us know. We've got sponsorship slots. We'll even wear this shirt, you know, can probably easy for you to get the can than me uh, for a shirt. Uh -huh. But, uh, but uh, you know, in fact, he can decorate his whole place. If you've got enough stuff. I mean, we're not above, the NASCAR approach. <laughs> no, we're not. You know, he'll be sponsored by whatever sport drink you want or whatever, you know, a, a donut shop, uh, whatever, pita store, whatever you got, subs, pizza. Uh, anyway, so, uh, yeah. Any final words, Ken? Any final words on this episode? No, here? It, was, it, was, it was fun, and uh, I, I think this would be good. And I think the guys that – intellectually intuitively resonate with what we're saying hopefully we're inspiring because that, that's my goal with all this you know inspire these guys to hopefully get into a, a process like we have because like we've said the benefits are way beyond anything to do just with fighting you know if it was just about fighting I would have probably completely bailed from all this a long time ago I mean I don't go out and get in fights I'm not in that kind of profession you know uh, he's, lying. Some, he's, uh, lying. Uh, he's lying he's lying he's lying yeah, I don't get in fights, man. I, you know, I've always said that, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's kind of like Bruce's thing, you know, with how he used to do his ranking with the empty circle, then it yeah. would gradually yeah. fill and go empty again. You know, I look yeah. at it like the, the, the most basic self-defense technique is to run away, right? Yeah. Effective basic one, right? After you go through decades of training and experiences, the most effective self-defense technique is to run away, but yeah. you're running away at a higher level because you know all the stuff that can happen. You're running away with a whole different mentality about why you should be, I'll say avoiding rather than running away. Let's put it, let's leave it like that. Hey, when yeah, you go well, off, let's talk for a minute. Cause yeah, well, what, what I will say is that the reason he's saying that is because he likes jazz, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, baby. cool cat. <laughs> That's easy to get Ken going. It's easy to get Ken going. It's it. It's it, it, it it, it, it's good for me because it's just Ken. It's just he comes back, man. But I've got Stan there, and then I got to listen to Stan chime in with, with you know, jazz. Well, yeah, yeah, you know, it's like, oh my god, I'm getting ganged up on. You know, I get ganged up well, on. I'll tell you something about all the old, the older cool cats. You know, hmm. well, you know their, you know, their mentality. We haven't thrown any any seventies lingo in. Damn it, we forgot to do that. I've just been calling you a cool cat for the last fifteen minutes. Well, yeah. But <laughs> But I mean, wow, well, we forgot that we need to, yeah, let's far out. Next episode's going to be far out and right on. We're going to keep yeah. on trucking. Oh, man. On yeah. trucking. In episode two, 
And uh, if you if you if you're down with that, uh, we'll be <laughs> we'll be back. But uh, anyway, so thanks everybody, and uh, st st get uh, stay stay glued to your messenger there, uh, Ken. I'll I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk to you in messenger. Okay. Can we just get off the live and stay on for a sec? Uh, I have to reconnect it. I'll I'll have to reconnect. Oh. It. Okay, right. okay, hang on. All right. So uh, see everybody next time. You guys, and, thanks. Yeah.